Andy Dufat, Cavalcade of America, starring Helen Hayes. Tonight, the Dupont Company brings you The Flame, starring Helen Hayes on The Cavalcade of America. And now, The Flame, starring Helen Hayes on The Cavalcade of America. The men are downstairs happy with their cigars, and here we await them in the drawing room. Ta- thus, all bow to custom. We certainly do, and I like it. Well, I don't like it, Aunt Minnie. Eleanor. No, truly, Mother, I don't like it. I don't always have to agree with Aunt Minnie, do I? The trouble is, darling, you never agree with your elders. I agree with Mrs. Cat. Oh, I'm very much flattered to have you agree with me, Eleanor. <laughs> you wouldn't be, Mrs. Cat, if you knew the ideas this young lady has. Oh, Aunt Minnie. What ideas? I'm sorry to say, Mrs. Cat, that my daughter is entranced with this Susan B. Anthony person who goes around speaking out for women to vote. Is that so terrible? Why, she's a suffragist. Yes, I know. I've heard of Susan B. Anthony, but I still say, is it all so terrible? Why, of course it is. I don't see why. Surely the idea that women are human beings with intelligence enough to distinguish a rascal from an honest man and to vote for the honest man, why, surely such an idea isn't complete heresy. Well, it goes much deeper than that. Yes, indeed. These suffragists forget a woman's place. Why, Eleanor here has grieved her father. How? He's arranged a fine marriage for her. A young man... Young? He's 37. A young man with an excellent position in the Charmot Bank. And her ladyship says he isn't good enough for her, if you please. Oh, I'm sure she didn't say that. I'll bet all Eleanor said was that she didn't love him. That's just what I said, Mrs. Cat. He's too solemn, and, and he treats me as if I were... were well, a piece of property? Yes, that's it exactly. I know that sort of man, Eleanor. Oh, well, I know the sort of man you mean, Nevertheless, Eleanor. you'll marry him, young lady. Yes, no matter who advises you differently. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to meddle in the affairs of your family. All right, all right, now quiet, everybody. Men are coming back. We've got to act like ladies. Very good cigar, George. Very good. Glad you like it, William. Well, and now how have the ladies been enjoying themselves in our absence? George and I were speculating as to what you were talking about. Crocheting, cooking, new hats. <laughs> We've been talking about Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony? That suffragist who, who wants her sex to have the right to vote? Yes. <laughs> How could a woman vote when she doesn't even know one officer of the government? <laughs> well, yes, that's sensible. A person ought to know the officers of the government if he's to have the vote. Well, of course. Who's the Secretary of Agriculture? The Secretary of Agriculture? All right, all right. Who's, who's Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Why, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, it'll come to me. <laughs> when you give up, just ask me. I know. Well, I... I suppose you do. But that silly Susan B. Anthony wants all women to have the right to vote. I don't call Susan B. Anthony silly, Daddy. No, I know you don't. You don't call anybody silly except the good, solid citizens of the community. But I've had enough from you, young lady. You're going to do what I say from now on, you hear? But, Daddy... No buts, no buts, you'll do what I say. I won't have a daughter that tries to get me to send her to college, that, that tries to vote, that turns against her father, that refuses to marry the man I pick for her. And just so that you'll have time to think that over, young lady, I suggest you get your coat and hat, order a handsome cab, and go home immediately. Yes, Dad. Mr. Courtney. Yes? Your daughter's a guest in my home. Yes, and I must apologize to you, Mrs. Cat, for her behavior. Her behavior, indeed. It's your behavior, your autocratic assumption of superiority, your tyranny over this young girl that you should apologize for. You think so, eh? I think so. Then all I can say, Mrs. Cat, is that if your husband hasn't given you a sound thrashing yet, he should and so. <gasps> Has Eleanor gone? She's gone, William. She obeyed you, of course. Get a grip on yourself, Carrie. I'll be all right. Thank you, George. Uh, well, everyone, shall, shall, shall we go into the music room? Yes, darling? George, I don't know how I lived through it. 
that man and the subservience of those women to him, the things they're doing to that nice young girl. Yes, yes, I understand, Carrie, but couldn't we discuss it sitting down? Hmm? <laughs> of course. Well, Carrie... George, hmm? I've come to a decision. Yes? Tonight decided me. That man tonight. He's just impossible, of course. Yes, but why, George? Well, now you're being cryptic, Carrie. You're trying to drive me towards some point or other. What is it? I'm trying to make you associate one idea with another idea. The idea of this man's being wrong with something that you said to me once. Something that you said about me, George. <laughs> is this a guessing game? It's more serious than that. I see. Well, that man was ridiculing the idea that women had any rights... That they should vote, even. Whereas I once said of you, not just that you should vote, but that if you had been a man... Is this it, Carrie? This is it. If I'd been a man, I could have been a governor of a state or a senator. That's what you said about me, George. Yes. That must be true of many women. Well, not many women have your abilities, Carrie. As many women as men. That's quite true, I'm sure. I want to talk about all those women now, George. They have ability. This means that they have energy. A little more energy than most people, men or women. How do they... How do you think they feel, George? What do you mean? I mean... Well, look at them in their kitchens, in their drawing rooms, in their nurseries. Don't you find them sometimes sad? Don't you find them sometimes querulous, difficult to get on with? Don't you think sometimes that, that these exceptional women must be exceptionally unhappy, thinking... No, no, not thinking, not daring to think of their businesses still unformed, of their laboratories still too spotless, of the books they haven't written, the stages they haven't stepped on, the waste of energy and ability, the waste of their lives. You know what the anti-suffragist fellow would say to that. I know. He'd say that women were lucky in not having the responsibilities that men have. Yes, exactly. Well, he'd be wrong, because it's not a question of whether one is lucky or unlucky, whether responsibility is fun or not. If you have certain abilities, you have the... If you have the energy to direct those abilities, you can't bottle it up, even if you want to, or there'll be an explosion. Uh -huh. That's what you meant when you said that the women of ability were unhappy. Yes, because they're not using their abilities. Mm. Carrie. Yes, George. Go ahead. What do you mean? I mean, go ahead. Do what you want to do. And if you're not certain of what that is, why not see Susan B. Anthony? Go ahead. Oh. You're the most understanding man alive, George. And I love you more than ever right now. Well, here we are, Mrs. Cat. This is my study. I believe that is the most comfortable chair, then. Well, then you should take it, Miss Anthony. Me? Oh, no. I've spent my life being uncomfortable in a good cause. It's no time for me to start being comfortable now. I suppose you're right. I suppose it's never easy being a suffragist. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. On the other hand, for some women, it's easier to be a suffragist, hard though that is, than it is to sit back and do nothing about the problems of votes for women. You are that kind of woman, Miss Anthony. I'm afraid so. Are there many like that? Some. Uh, not many. I'm always on the lookout for a new one. How, how can you tell when you find her? Oh, I don't give away my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that I had more time to give to you, Mrs. Cat. I'm always interested in any woman who says she wants to join the suffragist movement, but just now I'm rather busy. I probably shall not be able to see you after tonight. I hope I'm not intruding or oh, anything. Oh, no, no, no. It's just that I'm preparing for a lecture tour. You'll be lecturing on woman suffrage? Yes, yes. But aren't you... Uh, I mean, won't, won't it be a very difficult journey? <laughs> you mean, I'm old? <laughs> All right, Miss Anthony, I mean, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for not pretending. I won't pretend either. I am old. <laughs> and I wish someone were going with me. I'll go with you, Miss Anthony. Are you sure you want to? Quite sure. It will be months before you'll see your husband. He'll understand. Well, you, you'll only have a few days to get ready. Oh, that's all right. Very well, we'll go together then. Oh, good. <laughs> did you notice what I did? Well, oh, what do you mean? I told you that I wanted someone to go along with me. I gave you the opportunity either to say you would come or to say nothing. 
You said you'd come. Of course I did. I don't understand what you're driving at. I'm answering a question of yours, my dear. You asked me how I could tell a good suffragist when I found one. This is how, Mrs. Cat. Well, Carrie, how do you like speaking in the cause? I like listening to you better than speaking myself. But you're a good speaker. You're a great speaker. Did you know it? I think from now on, I'll make shorter speeches and you'll make the longer ones. Carrie? Yes, Miss Anthony? Cold, isn't it, Carrie? Why, uh, yes. Is it cold? Oh, have I just grown too old for lecture tours? It's cold, of course. You're all right, Miss Anthony. No, no, I'm not. I am old. I'm old. You're going to have to carry on for me, my dear. Nonsense. You're the greatest and the most vigorous woman I've ever met. You'll be able to stand up on a platform and sway people when the rest of us have grown tired in the service. Do you know, Miss Anthony... Why, Miss Anthony? <laughs> All right. Sleep, you great woman, you. You've earned it. Yours is the 11th state that Mrs. Cat and I have come to. We are women and we have been speaking for two months now to other women like yourselves. Uh, we have a message for you. We are women and we have been speaking for two months now. We have a message for you. Yours is the 11th state Miss that we have... Oh, my dear, I'm all confused. Miss Anthony, can I help you? No. No, I... I quite all right now, but I'm tired. Uh, ladies, uh, ladies, Mrs. Cat will carry on for me. I, I must be excused, please. It's quiet here in the park, George. Yes, Carrie. Quiet, dark, and beautiful. I've been appreciating quiet more than ever lately. Getting old, I guess. Of course not. <laughs> Everyone loves quiet. I love it. You're just collecting the dividends you've earned, Carrie. Do you know something, George? No, what? I'm grateful to you. Why? Because you've treated me like a human being. <laughs> I wasn't aware that you were an ogre. Mm, we live in a day and an age, George... Well, not many women are treated like human beings. They're respected, yes. They're worshipped, even. But they're not considered very bright. They're thought of as possessions, valuable, precious, sacred possessions. But not human beings with a right to lives of their own. Now, now, just a minute, darling. Don't make a speech. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, don't be. It was a very nice speech. But you know, now that you're president of the Suffrage Association, I'm sure most men will come round to giving women their rights. Oh, yes, I'm sure of it. <laughs> But I'm grateful to you, darling, for not waiting until later. Carrie. Yes? You know I'm devoted to the cause of women. But that isn't why I've acted as I have. I'm in love with you. That explains most of the things I do. I know, George. Well, oh, I wanted to get that said tonight. And I'm glad you said the things you did tonight, too, Carrie. Why? What's special about tonight? I... I'm very tired tonight. George, what's the matter? Ben, I'm very happy tonight. Is anything wrong, George? No, you look so, so... No, nothing wrong. I'm very happy, but... I'm very tired. George. <gasps> oh! Oh!
You are listening to Helen Hayes in The Flame on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. A fatal heart attack and George Catt was dead. Then came the dreary days, the hard years, years filled with work, until there came the time when Carrie Chapman Catt needed rest. She went to Europe with her secretary, Mary Hay. Just now, they're in a hotel room in Paris. Oh, Mary, isn't this wonderful, this luxury? Mm, wonderful. Not like sitting in hotel rooms back home waiting to receive delegations, telephoning instructions, waiting for news of how this or that state is going. Now, Carrie. All right, all right. I'll relax. Mm -hmm. Well, that's <laughs> what you're here for, you know. Come in. Hello. I have been sent here with the extra blanket you wanted. Oh, yes, I'll take it. Thank you. Pas de quoi, madame. Wait a minute. Huh? Oh, what is it, Carrie? I, I'm sorry. I I wonder if you'd mind talking to me for a few minutes. Not at all. Well, what on earth, Carrie? Uh, could we close the door? Well, of course, but... I'm sorry, madame. But you look like a good, honest woman. A woman of the people. I am a woman of the people. Certainly. And I am far from my country where I know so many women like you. It would be wonderful to talk to you. It would be like talking to them again. Madame is homesick. If I am, I hadn't realized it until this second. Surely, madame, you, a woman of wealth, do not know many common people. Yes, I do. In America, it's been my business to know the common woman, to try to improve her lot in life. Yes. Yes. And how do you do this? By agitating for the politicians to allow her to vote. <laughs> that is good. That is fine for women to vote. In Europe, we have a long way to go before that becomes the problem. What do you mean? Here in Europe, women cannot own property. Oh, the law allows it in many places, but custom does not. I have traveled, madame. I have an inquiring mind, so I have traveled over most of Europe. I have seen those of my sex acting as beasts of burden. In many villages, for a man to beat his wife is nothing. Even his wife expects it. I myself work in this hotel because I will not go back to my province, to my family, to the man they want me to marry. He's of good family, but he's a drunkard. I prefer to remain here. I should think so indeed. Where are some of these villages you spoke of, madame? Carrie. Oh, yes, Mary, we're going to visit those villages. Where are they, madame? We're going to visit them, and then we're going to do something about them. <laughs> Very happy to receive you, Mrs. Cat. You'll forgive me if I stay seated. I've been plowing all day. Thank you. Thank you. I know from what you women in this village and all the other villages tell me that you want to be freed. I will try. I will lecture. I will do what I can. God bless you. Welcome to Hamburg, Frau Katz. But let me take you to the hall by the back way. There is a crowd of 5,000 admirers blocking the main route. Mrs. Cat, we're so delighted to have you address the British women. Well, do you know we're going to have Albert Hall filled to overflowing? The women of China are sorry to see you leave, Mrs. Cat. You have brought hope to our people and our ancient nation. It's no use. We're going home. Conceding defeat, Carrie? No. Just changing tactics. The best way to bring emancipation to the women of the old world is to have the women of the new world lead the way. In America, let's build an example for Europe. Let's get suffrage in America. The rest will follow. We're certainly glad you've been back with us as long as you have, Mrs. Cat. We want you to be president of the National Suffrage Organization again. I said I wouldn't be. I know, but haven't our arguments persuaded you? Somewhat. You know, Mrs. Whitehouse made the best speech I ever heard when she accepted office in the New York Woman's Suffrage Party. She said, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm willing to work, and I'll do my best. Now, I'm old... I'm not healthy. I'm tired out. 
but I'll do my best, too. And my first task will be to win over Woodrow Wilson. And it's good of you to come here to Atlantic City to address our suffragist convention. Why, thank you, Mrs. Cat. It's not enough, though. Oh, Carrie Chapman Cat, you're a hard woman. And Woodrow Wilson, sir, you are a politician. <laughs> <sighs> Can you tell me what you're going to say? Oh, nothing startling. That's what I was afraid of. I'm afraid you're going to say that we're nice ladies and that you're glad to, uh, that we take an interest in public affairs and that, of course, you won't endorse us, but you'll defend to the death our right to agitate. <laughs> Something like that is exactly what I'm going to it's say. It's not good enough, Mr. President. Oh, unfortunately, I'm in politics, Mrs. Catt. There's a war going on in Europe. We may, God forbid, be drawn into it. I know. I know your motivation, motivations, Mr. Wilson. You want to run for president again in 1916. I may want to. Why? I have some ideas. I have some policies. I think you'll like them, and I think you'll agree they should take precedence over the suffragist cause. Are they secret? At present, some of the details are. But I don't mind letting you know confidentially that what I envisage is a world organization. A union of all nations, as we have a union of all states, banded together, perhaps more loosely than we are, but for the same purpose to promote the world's general welfare. It's a grand concept. It's necessary, too. After this war, after the next war, after some war, sometime, the nations will have to come together with the serious purpose of stopping it. But you know what they'll say about you when you propose it. <laughs> I know. Visionary, idealistic, it'll never work. Exactly. Why don't you address our convention tonight and say that you favor woman suffrage? I don't see the connection. What would happen if you did that? Why, suffrage for women would prevail. Suffrage for women would prevail, exactly. Oh, it might take a few years. But you could ensure our success if you spoke as you feel tonight. But what has this to do with my idea for an organization of all the nations? Just this, Mr. President. Suffrage for women is visionary, idealistic, too. People have been laughing at the idea for a century now. What if we win? What if we win because you push us on to victory? It would prove that a visionary, idealistic president can actually achieve his dreams. And you mean it would serve as an answer to critics of world organization? Wouldn't it? I'll think it over. I might do what you suggest, Mrs. Cat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have proved this. There is one thing mightier than kings and armies, aye, than congresses and political parties, the power of an idea when its time has come to move. The time for woman's suffrage has come. The woman's hour has struck. And now tonight, we suffragists gather here, and we look at one another and our eyes shine. And our eyes are moist, and we smile and we clasp hands, and our voices choke, because never again do we have to say, when the time comes, for the time is now. Tomorrow Congress meets, and tomorrow Congress passes the National Woman Suffrage Amendment. Most of the states favor it already, and ratification will follow swiftly. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is now, and God bless each one of you who helped make this time come. Oh, hello, Mrs. Cat. Yes? I have some flowers for you, Mrs. Cat. Here. Oh, how very sweet. Won't you come in? Thank you. Sit down. I don't mean to take up your time, Mrs. Cat. Bless my soul, of course you mean to take up my time. You didn't bring me flowers unless you wanted to talk to me. <laughs> well, I guess you're right. <laughs> Do you want to talk about anything in particular? Or are you just curious to see what an old woman looks like? I, well, you'll think I'm silly, Mrs. Cat, but... But I voted today for the first time. Yes. And, and I want to thank you. 
My child, forgive me. You've moved me more than I... more than I realized was possible any longer. I only wish there was something... something I could do for you. Something I could do for all of you who fought before I was even born. Well, you did something for us when you voted, child. I suppose when you look at it that way, it's true. Of course, it's quite true, quite true. You know, a suffragist is just one of a long and ancient line of women who changed your status and mine from bondage to freedom. You thank those women when you go to school, when you work, when you marry into partnership rather than household slavery. Of course, you thank us when you vote. And you know, we old ones who worked for all this, we have something to thank you for, too. Some, something to thank girls like me for? What? For being alert and intelligent and alive. For being awake to what is going on around you. For being fresh and sweet and independent. You're what we had in mind, my dear. Thank you. Now I'm an old woman. I, I must take my nap. <laughs> Do you mind? Oh, of course not. I'll go. Thank you for coming. I think my dreams will be pleasant ones. Goodbye. We'll return in just a moment. But first, here is Gaines Whitman speaking for DuPont. Somewhere in your house, there is a bottle or a jar that was wearing a little collar when you bought it of colored or clear cellulose film. If you removed the collar using only your fingers, you found that it was on good and tight. You may even have wondered why they put such things on bottles anyhow. Why do they? There's a reason. In fact, there are several very good reasons why these little DuPont cello seal cellulose bands are used. American manufacturers guard the reputation of their products. They want the things they make to come to you as fresh and pure as when they leave the factory. Or you might not continue as a customer. So many of them give their containers the double protection of cello seal bands made by the DuPont company, which are essentially tamper-proof because they are put on wet and shrink to a tight fit as they dry. For example, if a bottle of vinegar in a grocery store is opened, it is liable to develop vinegar mother. The mother doesn't really do it any harm, but it looks bad. Everybody prefers vinegar that is clear and sparkling. So many vinegar bottles are protected by cello seal bands to keep the screw caps from backing off and letting air in. Here's another example. Take a bottle of perfume, witch hazel, or some other product which evaporates. When an ordinary closure is used on such a bottle... You can open the container and smell the contents. It's quite a temptation to take a really good sniff. And every time anybody does that, a little of the contents evaporates. Some of it may spill and be lost. When a manufacturer seals his bottle with a DuPont cello seal band, he knows and you know the product is coming to you untouched and with no loss from evaporation or spillage. The same thing is true of a wine bottle. Cello seal is for your benefit as a consumer. But if you are a manufacturer and you'd like to see what Cello Seal will do for your product, just mail one of your containers to the radio section, DuPont Company, Wilmington, Delaware. We'll send it back to you wearing a brand new Cello Seal collar, one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> week, Cavalcade star is Lee Bowman, who will come to New York from Hollywood to appear as Dr. Bailey Ashford in The Unnatural Death. After the Spanish-American War, a mysterious tropical disease swept over the island of Puerto Rico. You'll hear how Dr. Ashford, an American officer in our occupation forces, helped restore health and security to the civilian population. Next Monday night, don't miss Lee Bowman in The Unnatural Death on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. 